Hey there, we are so grateful that you are joining us in a part of our church today and that you're jumping in to watch this message. Hey, I'm Jay, one of the pastors here at Covenant Church, and I'm so grateful that you would be a part of our church family wherever you are and wherever ever you're watching from. Maybe today is your first time watching our online or experiencing Covenant Church. You're new and just checking things out. We get that. And, and we're glad that you're here to do that. Would you do us a huge favor? We would love to get connected with you. So text the word NEW to 252-304-0222. We have a gift for you and one of our team members would love to follow up with you. This is just our way of saying thanks for being here. Well, let's jump right into this week's teaching time. Again, thanks for being here and have a great day. Now we are in the, the book of Acts in this sermon series. We're calling it Influencers. And uh, so far we have we've seen three people, the story of three different folks, and and they, they've all had a different texture to their story. It, it's interesting to me, sometimes someone's influence will be widespread with a lot of people, like Stephen's in Jerusalem or Philip's in Samaria. Uh, sometimes a person's influence will just be with one other person. And that's what we saw with the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Of course, that man then went and his influence was widespread because he led hundreds of people to Christ as he went back to Africa, back to Ethiopia. Uh, today, we're going to look at uh, the story of a man named Ananias who is going to have a more focused influence on one other person. And God is going to ask Ananias to do something for him. And that one thing will turn out to be such an, a major influence that it will change another person's life forever. And so today, what I want to talk about is that this, this directive from God that comes to this man Ananias and uh, talk about it because he, he has to decide whether he's going to do what God asked him to do or not. Now, I wonder, has the Lord ever told you to do something? Or you felt like in your heart that you were being directed to do something and you had to choose whether you were going to do it or not? Um, I, I usually put those into two categories, by the way. When, when the Lord directs me to do something, sometimes I just don't want to do it. Anybody else with me? I just don't want to do it. It would be inconvenient for me, it would be really hard. It would change my plans or my routine, whatever. I just don't want to do it. And then sometimes the, the Lord might ask us to do something and we don't want to do it because we're afraid. I mean, it's, yeah, it's going to be a hard thing and we don't know how it's going to turn out. And so, you know, I'm going to have to say something to somebody and I, I, I need to do it. I just, I'm afraid to do it, or I've got to stand up for what's right, or I've got to go somewhere I've never been. I don't know what it is, but you know, I'm afraid to do it. Uh, sometimes it's a combination of both those things. <laughs> I don't want to do it, and I'm afraid to do it. Um, a long time ago, well, it's not that, that long ago, but a number of years ago, um, I got up, and I was going to have my quiet time, so I, I don't know what you do when you're up and you're going to uh, spend time with the Lord, I, I get all of my equipment together. So I had my, had my Bible, had my journal, had my, I got to have the right kind of pen, y'all. Okay, I've got my pen, I've got my water bottle, I'm ready to go. Lay it all out on my desk, you know, lay it all out where I usually spend time. And I got all of it ready, I got, I, I settled in, and the Lord spoke to me. Now, we, we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, how do you know if it's the Lord and not your own idea? Well, uh, this particular thing that I sensed checked all the boxes. All right, it was totally spontaneous. It was not my idea. 
and um, it, it felt like it was coming from the depth of my heart. And I think over time, when you when you sense the Lord speaking to you, um, and you've you've heard it before. It's like it gets easier to hear it, but it was coming right from the depth of my heart. I, I confirmed, I, I felt like this was the Lord speaking. And uh, this is what he said to me. He said, I want you to get up and go call this particular person on the telephone right now. And I, I looked at my watch and I thought, it is really early. I mean, it's like 6.30 in the morning. And um, I, I probably even said it out loud. I'm not calling anybody at 6.30 in the morning. I am not going to call this person. So I ignored this word. And I went back to reading my Bible. Now, you know, when you go to read your Bible in the morning, that's called spending time with the Lord. All right? It's not just I was reading my Bible. Here's the time I was supposed to be spending with the Lord. The Lord spoke to me. I said, no. So I'm going to go read my Bible. And um, anyway, I could not get that word out of my heart. And so I, I was like, I'm not going to be able to even get through this paragraph. So I decided, and you know, sometimes when you're, you're tired in the morning and you're trying to read your Bible, you're falling asleep, it's good to stand up. So I stood up and I'm walking around with my Bible. I am going to get through this paragraph, but I could not get that word out of my crawl it was stuck in there so then I had the idea that I would just read the scripture out loud to myself you know and so I'm, I'm reading it out loud which really in effect was me going la 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 right well I just couldn't I mean I did this for a long time finally I just said Lord surely you don't want me to use the telephone before seven o'clock in the morning I mean, you don't, I just can't imagine that that's what you want me to do. You don't want me to, I mean, and if I call him, what am I going to say to him? I mean, I don't know why I'm calling him. And uh, it, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to look foolish. I will probably offend him. And you don't want me to offend him. Well, I did this for a long time. Eventually, I mean, it had been about an hour. I looked at my watch. It is 730. I said, okay. I mean, I wish, I wish you could have been there. I'm, I'm, I'm gyrating all the time. Okay, Lord, I will call him then. So I called, the, called him on the telephone, and I said, Hey, how are you doing? Um, I just sensed that the Lord wanted me to call you today, call you this morning. And he said, Wow, well, it's really timely. He said, I have had the worst morning I have been struggling. I have needed encouragement, he said, but I'm, I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm about to come out of it. I wish you had called about an hour ago. <laughs> now, you, you understand, I wasn't struggling with where the word came from, right? I, I knew where it, I knew who was talking to me. Uh, the, the part I was struggling with is that I, I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to lose face. I didn't want to be embarrassed. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how it would turn out. So I was, I mean, it's just a telephone call, but I mean, I was afraid to move forward. And isn't it interesting that the, the command that is used most in the Scripture is do not be afraid because so much of the time we're afraid to do things. We're afraid to do what we know we ought to do. We're afraid. And, and over and over the Lord says, do not be afraid. Trust me. Trust me. You can, you can trust me. So today we're going to look at a case study in trying to figure out whether you're going to do what the Lord has asked you to do. And we're in Acts chapter 9, so if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there, or you can follow along with me on the, the insert or on the screen today. Uh, last week, we, we looked at the story of Saul of Tarsus and his conversion, 
And when I mean conversion, it was a conversion, wasn't it? This man was a, um, a, re- just a fanatic, uh, religious Jewish leader who hated Christians so much that really he had become a terrorist. And he got permission to go from Jerusalem to Damascus. I mean, that's 150 miles. And uh, put Christians, find them, put them in chains, and drag them back to Jerusalem. I mean, this was a dangerous man. And on the way there, God stopped him in his tracks. Jesus spoke to him personally, and when he finished talking to him, he was on the ground. He got up, and he had to be led by the hand into the city because he was blind as a bat. This was a blinding light, and he recognized that it was Jesus speaking to him, but he could not see. And then this is what the Lord said, you are to go in the city, and I will tell you what you are to do. You wait, I'll tell you what to do. Now, in the meantime, here's what happens. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, clearly, what the Lord asked Ananias to do was uh, much more um, difficult than calling somebody at 6.30 in the morning on the telephone, right? Then this... This was totally, this was a dangerous thing that the Lord asked him to do. And it's no wonder he was uncertain and full of fear. This man, and he knew the name, he had never met him, but he knew who he was. This man murders Christians. He murders people who call on the name of Jesus. And so this would be like, the Lord telling you, hey, I want you to run over to Osama bin Laden's house for me. And I, 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 want, I got a message I want you to share with him. I mean, we would go, excuse me? Like, you know, were you, who, were you, who were you speaking to? Now, I, I want to pause just a second because you may have noticed something here. It says that the Lord spoke to Ananias in a vision. And then he also spoke to Saul in a vision. So in this little paragraph, there's two visions. So what in the world is a vision? Well, a vision basically is like a dream, except you're awake. Because sometimes God speaks to people in dreams. Sometimes God speaks to people through a vision. They envision, they can picture it in their minds and... Uh, They're not asleep. Um, But I would say these are rare. This is a rare way. Most of the time, God speaks to us through his word. Or he speaks to us through our in our hearts. Um, This would be a a rare kind of thing. And so I just need to say, um, not everything you dream is from the Lord. And not everything you envision in your mind is uh, what the Lord would say either. Um, I had somebody this week tell me, guess what? I dreamed last night, and you were in my dreams. And I said, really? And they said, yeah. And they told me what it was. And they said, what do you think that means? I said, it means that not everything you dream is of the Lord. (laughs) That might have been a nightmare that I was in your dream, right? So I I think this is a, a rare kind of thing that is happening here, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting how there are two visions, but clearly Ananias knows where it's coming from because he answers. You know, he hears his name, Ananias, and he, yes, Lord. You know, here I am, I, here I am, I, I hear you, 
and, and I'm ready to respond. So, you know, I, I want you to go over, I want you to go over, over to Judas's house on Straight Street. I want you to go find a man named Saul of Tarsus. Will you go do that for me? Now, let me ask you, if that was you, how, how, would, how would you respond to that? I mean, it's not only is it, uh, is it dangerous uh, to go do this, I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. Why would I go looking for that guy, right? On, on top of that, when he gets there, guess what he's supposed to do? He's supposed to go lay his hands on the guy so he can see. Ananias is thinking, I don't want that guy to ever see because he might see me and he might kill me and he might put me in chains he might drag me back to Jerusalem uh, Lord uh, do you know who this is and the Lord says yes I know exactly who it is um, I want you to go you know the Lord doesn't owe us an explanation when he asks us to do something because he's the Lord, right? He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't have to explain anything. But he does say a little bit here to Ananias. He says, uh, I know exactly who he is. And I've chosen him. And i got a plan for him. So I need you to go and do this for me. Uh, I want you to notice, though, he doesn't tell him everything, does he? He doesn't say, listen, it is going to be so great. Let me tell you my whole plan. He is going to be the most influential person who has ever lived. He's going to write half of the New Testament. He is going to plant churches from here to the other side of the known world. He is going to raise up men and women to lead his church everywhere and shepherd people. It is going to be great. He just says, I know who he is, and I'm asking you to go and do this for me. You ever wonder... Why, why does God act that way? Why didn't God just bypass Ananias and go straight to Saul and tell him exactly what he wanted him to do? Well, because God, that's not God's plan. God's got a plan, but that's not the way he works. He's got an ulterior motive in everything he does. It doesn't mean he's sneaky. It just means he, he's, got, he's got something greater than we even know. And so this is the, the spiritual principle today. Don't miss it. God's ulterior motive is to teach us to trust Him. That's what He always wants to do. Everything He does is to teach us to trust Him. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. I want you to trust me. I want you to to move when I say move. I want you to do it when I say do it. I mean, when he says, Lord, don't you know who this is? Sure, I know who it is. Well, I might die. You're right. <laughs> Lord, don't you care? I do. I need you to go down to Straight Street and do this for me. I want you to trust me. Trust me, Ananias. Now, listen... I'm encouraged by Ananias. I mean, doesn't he encourage you? He didn't say, like a robot, yes, Lord, I will go. He goes, but Lord, are you crazy? <laughs> now, has anybody besides me ever said, Lord, are you crazy? Right? I, I've said it so many times, and I always regret it, because then he, he shows me he's not. He's not crazy. He knows exactly what he's doing. He can see the whole picture. And I eventually come back and say, you know what? I, I wish I just trusted you from the beginning. And so Ananias goes down to Straight Street, goes to the house of Judah, and finds Saul of Tarsus. Now, before I go on, one more quick aside, because I think this is important. Uh, the Lord says this, this one thing in the last part of that paragraph in uh, verse... Uh, actually, let me, let me read the paragraph. I didn't read it yet. So uh, it says, uh, this, this is his answer. This is his, his answer to 
um, God. He says, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man, all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. The Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's what I wanted to just say quickly. The Lord says, now in the future, this man doesn't know it yet, but in the future, he, he's, he's going to follow me, but it's going to be hard for him. He's going to have to suffer for my name. What does that mean? Well, what we would think it means is, okay, well, he's made a lot of other believers suffer. Now he's going to suffer. But that's not, that's not what it means. Now, what it means is that as, as this man begins to follow me, same thing that's going to happen to him is going to happen to all of us. It's, it is, it's always good, but it's never going to be easy. People are going to criticize you when you decide to be a Christian. People are going to uh, shun you. Members of your family are going to you know, call you names. They may threaten you. You may be ridiculed. Uh, Jesus told his disciples this. He said... Uh, Remember the words I spoke to you? No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Now listen, uh, when, when most of us became believers, it's not that someone lied to us. They just didn't tell us the whole truth. They said, listen, if you uh, make Jesus your Lord and Savior, if you ask him in your heart, things will go well with you. Your life will change for the better. And that's true. They just didn't tell us the rest of it. That as soon as you put on the name Jesus, you put a bullseye on your back. Because there is always going to be someone who doesn't like Jesus. I mean, Satan is going to go after you. There, it's going to be hard. It's, it's going to be hard to walk this road, which is why the Lord always wants to teach us how to trust him because we're going to need it. And listen, walking in this world, anybody else besides me, is scary crazy, right? It is scary crazy, but it is always worth it because you might have a bullseye on your back, but God's got your back, right? So it's what you do is you, you walk by faith and you trust. I mean, Jesus suffered for doing what was right. He suffered for doing what his heavenly father told him to do. If I'm following Jesus, I should expect the same thing. He says, Saul doesn't know this yet, but he will have to suffer for me. But he's my chosen instrument. And so, uh, as this is hard for you, Ananias, to do what I'm asking you to do today, there are going to be some hard things that this man is going to have to do too. And so Ananias went. And here are the results of his obedience it says, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell off Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Listen, let me, let me point out, every time you do what the Lord asks you to do, there will be the same two benefits that flow to you and will flow to other people as well. 
Uh, the first one is encouragement. I mean, Saul is blind as a bat. He doesn't know what's going on. He knows that Jesus just stopped him from his life mission and that everything is changing in his life. And then the Lord asks a guy he doesn't know to show up, and that man starts with this word, brother. Now, don't you know that was hard for Ananias, by the way, to call a terrorist a brother, <laughs> right? To say, hey, brother, hey, fellow follower of Christ, a uh, man who is in my own family. That must have been very encouraging to Saul because Saul was not a forgiving man. And so here's this guy who has been persecuted, chased by Saul, and he comes and says, hey, all is forgiven between us. And all is forgiven between you and God, too. Your sins have been forgiven. You are a new man. So Saul gets encouraged. He has forgiven me of my rage and my, my, all of it, my actions and my unbelief. And in the same way, Ananias gets encouraged because he goes into a place and sees a man and confronts his fear, and it's not as scary as he thought. And, you know, don't you know Ananias already had, you know, listen, if he whips out a knife, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and if, he, if he's going to try to, I'm going I'm to run in this direction. He's already got a plan. And, it's, and when he does what he's supposed to do, he gets encouraged. It is not nearly as scary as he thought in the beginning. And so he lays his hand, and then he lays his hands. Just think about this. He lays his hands on this guy and and is able to pray for him. How encouraging is that? Encouragement there fl flew, was flowing both ways. And, and then the, the other thing, the other benefit is empowerment. The Lord used Ananias to heal someone. I mean, when he went in, he probably said, okay, I, I'm going to do what the Lord says to do, but I, I don't, I've never seen it. And I don't believe it, that it can happen through me. And yet, the Lord uses Ananias. And can you imagine what this would be like to put your hands on this man? And then it says something like scales. It's not like he all of a sudden could see. It was like he got a physical demonstration of something falling off of his eyes. And he's going... Shazam! <laughs> wow! Wow! Look at that! And God empowers Ananias to do something pretty amazing. And then, as he turns around and prays for Saul, it says Saul gets up, starts out as a terrorist, gets baptized. That would be fun to do at Covenant Church, wouldn't it? Let's baptize, baptize some terrorists. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't you like to be here that day? And then, he goes on to be an incredible influencer. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He'll never be the same. So couldn't you imagine, can you imagine if Ananias had told the Lord no? No, I can't go down there. <laughs> can't go. I, I don't know where Straight Street is. Yes, you do. <laughs> I, I can't go down there. I'm not going to go. Uh, let me tell you what would have happened, by the way. The Lord would have asked somebody else to go because you're not going to mess up the Lord's plan by your disobedience. But think about it. Ananias would have missed out completely on this incredibly encouraging, empowering moment. And none of us want to miss out on being a part of that kind of thing because the Lord is always in the business of asking us to do things. And if we do, if we will trust him to do it, even when we don't want to do it, or even when we're scared to do it, it will always be a blessing for him and for us. Now, I want to end with uh, two words that appear in, in this story today 
And um, these two words are pretty important for us. And so let me just speak real briefly. One is about our identity. And, and it's the word saint. It says that, that Ananias says, uh, Lord, this man, Saul, is persecuting the followers of Jesus, and he calls them saints. Now, you may have grown up in a tradition where a saint was this person, you know, who was uh, so great, so far ahead spiritually that, you know, those people were folks you name buildings after, churches, holy days, right? Those are saints. But that's not the biblical meaning of saint. No, saint means a holy person. And none of us have the ability to be holy on our own. But when Jesus comes and lives in us and gets a hold of us, starts to work in us, uh, we become holy people. And so sometimes we make the mistake of saying, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And uh, that is not a true statement. I used to be a sinner. Now I'm a saint. See, I'm a holy person. I am someone who has been radically changed because I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm a saint. You're a saint. And then the other word that is here, it has to do with our activity. And it's the word sent. It's what happens to saints. The Lord sends them to do stuff. The Lord has tasks for us to do. And uh, Ananias says, uh, Lord, yes, Lord, here I am. I am your, I'm your man. I'm your, I'm a saint. Saints do what the Lord asked them to do. And that's the kind of people we want to be. That means that, that when you hear your name, even if it's 6.30 in the morning, even if it's, hey, I want you to run down to Straight Street and meet a guy who's a terrorist, whatever it is, whatever it is the Lord is asking you to do, if it's you're reading your Bible and you go, golly, doing that would really be hard. That it's like, that's the Lord calling you by name. And the answer, you know what Ananias says is, yes, Lord. I mean, you've done this work in me. I'm ready for you to use me widespread or for one person. But I'm here for you. Now let's stand. I, I want to I pray a prayer over us. And then we're going to worship. And then we're going to go from this place. So Lord, I pray for each of us today. Lord, you've, you've offered us what we could never have done for ourselves. Salvation forgiveness a, a brand new life eternal life and we're really grateful for that uh, we've been changed from death to life we've we've actually sung about resurrection so Lord today we want to be people who hear our names as saints and then say yes Lord yes what is it that you need me to do? Where is it that you want to send me? Here I am. I'm willing to go. In Jesus' name, amen.